Transmitting of music, I think, can only will only be successful if those receiving it already have some form of um, affinity with its sound. Mm. So, if, in other words, to try to teach music that someone has never heard um, or had no exposure to, what would be their connection to it? It would just have to, in other words, you could play them uh, some selections and then if they, if it resonated with them musically or if it moved them in a, emotively some way, uh, you know, and they would want to learn more, you know, then you have a subject, a, a recipient, a willing mm -hmm. recipient to receive the, the knowledge of this music. Because for most people, I think, who, for example, my, my native language is not Ladino, so why was I drawn to it? So I was drawn to it because there was already a foundation of the, of the Ladino culture. Mm. My interest in Ladino music and my interest in Sephardic liturgical music uh, occurred when I was, was very young, um, being a member of this community and uh, attending services, um, the music from that was produced in the in the synagogue was very much a part of it, it again it's like you hear music and you can't explain why you like it it just it just sits very well with you it's familiar music it's familiar words it reminds us of our uh, of our upbringing it reminds us of our aunts of our grandparents um uh, it, it reminds us of what we do in synagogue uh became very much a part of us and musically speaking you start singing and you discover that uh, you know maybe uh, you, you can do it professionally and you put time and you put effort and you uh, focus on that is how it evolved with me to sing professionally as a chazan as a cantor in a synagogue and to incorporate the ladino music specifically for community singing even though we love this music younger generation or the next generation who would pick up this music won't have the same narrative behind their understanding of the music that we did. And we're already two generations removed. It's transmittable, but are they willing? Mm -hmm. A lot of our community singing, you know, people are in prayer, they're uh, they like to relate to something which they're familiar with. And so music and, like I said, it was very nostalgic. They would hear this kind of music uh, that they might have grown up with in their homes from their parents and grandparents, the, the, the Ladino music in romances or, you know, from at weddings or, or uh, other happy events. And so that you would take that into the, into the synagogue and couple that with, you know, adapting it to prayers and it, it was a successful combination. One complemented the other very well. If the melody fits with the syllables of the Hebrew mm -hmm. and it's not onerous, uh, and it, it cannot be, there's no fast music. Uh, there's no like, you know, Cuando el Rey Nimrod is a, is a very fast song. You would have to slow that tempo down in order to use it, which I have. You slow the tempo down to use it in the synagogue. You cannot really do many things at a high tempo, a fast tempo um, for li liturgy. So you choose ones that are A, are popular, that have wide acceptance, and that you know many co-religionists already know. In other words, they may know the melody already. So now you put it to, to the words uh, that they have familiarity with, it resonates well. Well, I'll do Quando El Reni Marod. Naktishach venaritzach kenom siach sod sarfe kodesh hamshaleshi.
ve'amar. So you see at the end, you have to uh, transition into the makam. Kwandu al Rei Nimrod is, happens to be makam hijaz. So you, the melody works until the end when you have to serve it up, public refrain, and transition to the makam at the end. As long as it's within, if it's Judeo-Spanish, uh, and it's a popular tune, the chazan has artistic license. You can change it, you know, you can, each week you can do something different if you're creative enough. Etc. You could just make it fit. I never done. I have never done that one, but that one could be that you could do easily. That's a excerpt from Adio. Adio Kitty, the right, exactly. <laughs> to me, music and has to appeal to the masses. So if if you want to produce it in a style, but nobody's gonna, and it might be authentic as the as the day is long. But if it doesn't have willing listeners, it won't advance. I think it's very normal and acceptable to produce and interpret music for the generation in which we live, preserving the words, of course, but we interpret it based on our understanding of how we heard it and how we relate to other music. I think it needs to be, it has to honor and be respecting of the origins from which it came. So it came from, uh, and maybe I'm saying this prejudiced by my own um, beliefs system, but you wouldn't want to use it in a venue that would dishonor it, uh, or in a, in a tonal quality that would, you know, not give honor to the lyrics, or to the original artists, the composers, because you would want to honor its, their messages, so to speak, and in the, and in the milieu in which it was written. Both the melody, foundational melody, I'm not talking about reinterpreting a melody, but the foundational melody should not change and the lyrics should remain. They're the lyrics of the composer, so yeah, I don't think they should be changed. Most of the music I do is from hearing um, either older artists do it before me, uh, or if I heard a song that was um, in Hebrew, found out later that its origin was actually Ladino music, I would pick it up, and um, I liked the the tone, the tonal quality of certain singers and the music they were producing, and it was Ladino, and so I said, "That's that's our that's our community." I, whatever the source was, I I'm sure I reinterpreted it to you know nuanced here and there, but I tried to keep it as original to what I heard, not necessarily original to the to the origin of the specific song, because I'm sure it was very different, you know centuries ago than what it is today. I tried to keep it as true to its, the source from which I heard as I could. The hope is that generations to come and the younger generations today will have a, a knowledge of it such that it will, it would be music that they have familiarity with and that it represents their roots. Even from the lyrics themselves, you will learn about the temperament you will learn about the tendencies, you will learn about the drama and the humility that existed from those generations from when those lyrics were composed. And then that will teach the next generation uh, a new dimension of from where they came. And it will help perpetuate uh, what I think is just a, a beautiful collection of music that um, is part of their heritage and culture. Very little effort in transmitting this music, other than um, the recordings that uh, we're fortunate enough to have uh, by various artists. There is no public institution or even communal institution uh, where it's being transmitted. Those who have not, like I mentioned before, those who have not had exposure to it until just now, it may not, again, it may not resonate, so they may not even have uh, a desire to to learn it or to hear it or to study it more, let alone if there is a, a, an institution that is offering uh, their services to, to teach it on a, on a grander scale.
Ladino is not spoken on a daily basis here. Even amongst us who are through and through Judeo-Spanish, whether it be from the island of Rhodes or from Turkey or, or any of the Ladino-speaking locales uh, from where we came, our ancestors came, none of us is speaking Ladino on a, re on a, um, on a regular basis. And so it's, it's you know, at risk of getting lost and lesser and lesser known and also, all the more so the music because they go hand in hand.